Okay, I think we can get started now. Okay, cool. Sounds good. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us today um, in a very odd format than what we normally would host with events, but we're excited nonetheless. Um, as you can see, Shoshana is well prepared to talk about uh, licensing and telehealth, um, as is Dr. Mario behind her. So um, just real quick, if you're unfamiliar with R Street, which uh, I think most of you probably are familiar, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, public policy research organization, and our focus is on free markets and limited but effective government. And um, we cover a lot of different issues, but one that you probably know us for uh, better is occupational licensing reform. Uh, we focus a lot on that. And uh, Shoshana and I have worked on some stuff together in our commercial freedom uh, team on uh, ways to lower the barriers to consumer access for various things, including licenses to work. Um, and we've also done some work on telehealth before. Um, and with the onset of the pandemic, uh, the focus on telehealth and how licensing restrictions can um, impact telehealth have really become a primary focus over the last few weeks. It feels like maybe it's been a year, but my calendar says it's only been a few weeks. So um, to that end, Shoshana and I uh, wrote a piece uh, for the Washington Examiner on how we think opening the telehealth floodgates um, can really help uh, patients and doctors alike in a time like this. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with the op-ed, I did share it in the chat, so it should be in there if you wanna read it. Um, so I will, with that, I will turn it over to Shoshana to just tell you about what uh, she's doing. Hey everyone, I'm Shoshana. Many of you know me as Senator Shoshana on Twitter where I tweet way too much. Um, at R Street, I manage all of our digital media, but I'm also a policy fellow, so the scholars let me scholar with them. Um, and obviously many of you know that I just love occupational licensing reform. Um, and it's funny because even a couple of weeks ago, I figured with coronavirus that I would have a very small, if any, role at this time. But, um, but as you've seen, states have been constantly waiving different regulations and a lot of licensing regulations in particular. So I've been doing a lot of work with this um, and with our team. And Courtney and I have been going back and forth. And it's kind of nice we have an opportunity to talk, not just to all of you, but to each other about it because most of our conversation has been over Google Docs. <laughs> but um, there, there's a lot happening right now and it's, it's so hard to keep track. You know, a bunch of groups are putting together these long lists of executive orders and regulatory waivers, but it, it's hard to capture all of them just because there are so many. Um, so lots of groups and, and especially lots of state think tanks are focusing on their specific areas. But, um, but here we're going to talk about it more broadly and also um, more in regard to our specific areas of expertise. Um, Courtney with basically everything this covers, especially telehealth, and me as, as uh, licensing applies to telehealth. Um, so I think one thing that it would, that might help us get started is just, uh, Courtney, what have you seen lately that um, you have, that you've been surprised by with all of this? In regards to telehealth and licensing reform, especially, I have been, um, pleasantly shocked at how sometimes it's been literally hours, if not a couple of days before we've seen, you know, lawmakers and governors just basically uh, get rid of what probably would have taken us five to 10 years worth of, of reform work just to get them to pass similar measures. Um, but because we're in an emergency situation, it's been um, just very surprising that we're sort of you know, seeing like governors say, well, we're going to uh, go ahead and grant reciprocity. If you're a medical, like a licensed medical worker and you come here, like there, you know, you're not gonna have to go through the whole process. Um, with telehealth, we're seeing a lot of things like immediately the Trump administration announced that they were going to waive some of the um, current regulations on telehealth. So um, to kind of back up a little bit into that and just explain to you guys a little bit, maybe if you're not as familiar with the telehealth stuff. So if you've ever used like a teledoc type thing, right? It's a thing where you basically set up a, a remote appointment with the doctor um, and you go through the teledoc portal and there are a couple other um, formats like that. There's like platform that's like healthy as you and things like that. Um, but those are very um, restrictive in terms of like how they're used. And there's a lot of regulations surrounding them, right? HIPAA applies in this case, obviously. Um, and so there's a lot of red tape to cut through when you're talking about telehealth. But 
in the wake of this pandemic, what happened was that, like I said, the Trump administration basically said, hey, we're actually going to, um, during this time, uh, cover um, telehealth services that wouldn't otherwise have been covered for, uh, for patients who are um, on Medicaid um, and Medicare. And so it's that automatically opened up a whole door into, okay, well, what does that look like? How are we um, able to utilize that? Um, and one example of that is uh, that for telehealth services, you couldn't previously use FaceTime um, because it wasn't approved under, like Apple doesn't have a, a signed agreement um, as, a, as a HIPAA compliant company. And then we saw also basically uh, the Office of Civil Rights said, you know what, we're gonna waive those penalties as well. So you can use FaceTime to talk to your doctor or Skype. Um, and it's just sort of this crazy stuff that, like I said, has happened within the last two weeks um, and it's happened so fast. So I've been really surprised by that. Um, and I'm interested to hear what you're surprised by, what you've seen on the states with licensing. Well, one thing I want to ask you is why wasn't this so widely available before? I mean, last night I was uh, looking at DC's stay at home order for myself because I live in DC um, with Dr. Mario. And, um, and you know, uh, I, I was actually surprised by one of the provisions and I thought it was an error because you know how when regulations are written, sometimes there's just writing errors and it, they mean things in their text that they didn't mean to mean. Um, and it, it basically said that you must use telehealth unless there's a specific reason you have to physically go to the doctor. And that really surprised me. So I looked through some other states waivers and they said the same thing, like that was that was intentional and I was a bit surprised by that. But, um, but the fact that states are making this, uh, you know, um, not just saying you can use telehealth, but you must if you can. Um, why, why, why now? Like, I mean, obviously with coronavirus that prompted it, but why wouldn't this have been even an option, let alone a mandate before? That's an interesting question. And I'm not sure what the rationale would be for that, um, other than the protectionist measures that have been in place for a long time when it comes to um, who can perform what in a state and how they can perform it. And so, you know, it's the, the rise of telehealth itself before this, before the pandemic um, was happening. But now I think we're going to see just basically it's going to spike um, in use. And the fact that now states are saying, you know, you, you have to use these services if you um, want to talk to a doctor unless you absolutely have to go in, I think is, um, I think it's a good policy right now. Obviously, like you said, in times of the pandemic, yeah, but I think that it's really going to we're going to come out of this with a lot of evidence for how well telehealth works and how um, it translates to cost savings, not only for the patient themselves, but for the doctor's offices and for just healthcare spending in general. I think we're going to realize that um, the telehealth platforms, once we sort of work through some of the ones that are, you know, coming on board now um, and just the way like doctors are able, able to communicate with their patients, I think we're really going to see how well it functions um, if we do certain things correctly, right? There's still issues with implementation. A lot of people don't know how to use telehealth services. Um, some people don't have access to a video, which is another interesting thing. Previously, um, telehealth was defined as having a real-time audio video connection. And they've also, today, CMS announced they're out also doing away with that. So now you can just talk on the phone to your doctor because people don't have video access um, on their phones sometimes. And so we're, they've opened, it, opened the doors um, in that way too, which is really interesting. So I, I mean, it's why now, I think this goes back to what I, all the stuff we've been reading about everyone's a libertarian in a pandemic, um, because everyone kind of realizes like in times like these is when we need um, to, to get rid of these nonsensical uh, regulations that only, they only, they put up barriers to things that um, people can safely do. Telehealth is a very safe platform. I mean, especially if you're, you know, going for something that's not uh, life-threatening at the time, why not use telehealth? And the interesting thing is they're getting very innovative with telehealth. So um, there's now, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal either yesterday or today on the use of tele-ICUs. So people who are in ICUs are being connected with doctors through telehealth platforms. And they're actually, the doctors are not only speaking to them like this, they can zoom anywhere in the room. Um, they can, they're directly connected to the machines next to the patient. So this is extremely helpful when we're talking about patients who are in rural areas um, who may not have specialists around them and they can talk to a doctor while they're in the ICU just like they would 
you know, face to face. Um, so it's opening up access to things that people didn't previously have access to. And that's where I think too, that we're going to see some of the positive results of this that we can't turn our backs on once things go back to normal. No, I totally agree. And especially um, our colleague, Jarrett, um, who heads our commercial freedom work has done a lot of work on eye care. And for anyone who's super nerdy and into regulatory <laughs> reform like we are, um, there's, there's a history of protectionism. Um, I mean, across a lot of this stuff, but particularly when it comes to eye, eye regulations. Um, so Lee Optical is a famous case here. There's many cases over the years, um, whether in court or whether just you know, various regulations that have popped up. And I remember in recent history, Jared had been fighting to expand eye care access online um, in sensible, narrow ways that made sense. Um, but it, but he had faced so, so many, um, uh, so much opposition from it from doctors largely. And, and in a lot of cases, but not all this ends up being like a doctors v nurses fight, or it ends up being in state doctors versus out of state doctors. Um, and to that end, you know, I have Dr. Mario behind me. So technically he's based in DC and he would only be allowed to practice in DC unless he is also licensed elsewhere. Um, although I have questions about whether or not he's licensed at all, but I won't, I don't want to embarrass him or anything. But, um, you know, it's funny too, because in, in the majority of states and the majority of cases, unless they are part of a nurse compact or some other medical compact, they can't easily work across state lines. And I know that for telehealth, um, whether or not you're licensed to practice in a place. Um, it, it's about either the patient location or the portal location. So, um, so that adds some complication as to which doctors can treat different people over telehealth. And I know that lots of states have been waiving this, but what's so fascinating to me was, um, you know, last year when Governor Ducey in Arizona um, signed the states and the United States first legislation to make it super easy for people to transfer in their licenses when they moved to Arizona, um, you know, that was a big moment. I went down there for the signing and it was a great day. And I was very excited because I care about mobility. Um, as, as it happens with, with all cases, when you move across state lines, your license doesn't move with you. So that stops mobility in certain cases if people don't think they can work um, when they move, which can harm them um, because mobility and economic opportunity are tied close together. You know, you always hear about people moving for a new job or going closer to family maybe. So your mom can watch the kids or your dad can cook for the kids while you're at work, stuff like that. Um, so, you know, on the mobility side, that was huge already. And Pennsylvania also followed suit with a similar law and already this year, I think there were something like 20 states that, that had similar models, some better, some worse, depending. Um, but it's so wild that last year was when that happened. And this year you're seeing waivers across all these states, like, okay, we need something like this super quickly, which is just, hilarious because for years people have been railing saying we need that we need people to be able to work across state lines let alone medical professionals um and i think that tie-in is is going to be so important with te with telehealth going forward um i'm hoping that states start to waive regulations after this is all over or even before it's all over so that doctors can work across state lines um, but, and, and, you know, you're, you're seeing a lot of people either, um, come out of retirement or go from one state to another, but over telehealth, it, it's just so interesting because, you know, you think of it as some, some easier form of access and it is, but the licensing still applies. Um, how, you know, especially for you working less on the licensing side and more on the medical side of regulations, how has it been for you to, to see the tie in between reciprocity of licensing um, telehealth and what what the landscape used to be versus in the past two weeks what it's become. I think it's been kind of crazy to see how the landscape has changed. Um, and but the thing that I think we are kind of excited about <laughs> that I think you would agree is that it's really showing people just how much licensing occupational licensing affects everything. Um, you know, a lot of times it's thought of in sort of these like very niche areas, but again, like with this pandemic, who would have thought, like you said in the beginning, that occupational licensing would become such a big deal, but it's, it's because of a situation like this that we're able to, to show just how big of a deal it is to have portability, to have reciprocity, to have access um, to, license, to licensing that um, doesn't hinder people economically. Um, which is so important, again, in a, when a situation like this emphasizes that need. So um, on the medical side, it's been pretty nuts. Um, I really wasn't expecting HIPAA to basically be like, screw it. You guys can use FaceTime and Skype. Like, don't worry about it anymore. 
Um, I think we're going to see a lot of those things play out. I think we're going to hopefully, well, I guess what I'll say is that I think a lot of these changes are showing us that telehealth is here to stay, um, as well as hopefully license reciprocity uh, and portability, because I think we're going to see just how crucial it was to maintaining uh, a workforce uh, in the states that need it the most right now. Um, and how that really contributed to holding the economy together in a time like this. Um, and I think that like in talking to some other uh, groups who do a lot of telehealth advocacy and then groups that do a lot of like tech advocacy in general, talking about telehealth and how, you know, what the future of it's going to look like, it, the consensus basically is that, yeah, this is going to cause the use of telehealth to skyrocket. It's gonna become cheaper. It's gonna become more accessible for people because of the fact that these, uh, these, re these regulations were basically wiped away for the time being. I think we're gonna sh there's gonna be a surge in it for that. And so hopefully that means that agencies will um, see that those regulations were just harmful in the first place and that you know in a, in a normal economy sure there's more room for economic protectionism um, but in a pandemic there is no room for uh, silly protectionist rules that only keep some people from rising to the top um, just to keep some people happy so it's been really kind of crazy like I said this is unprecedented really um, in terms of medical uh, regulation reform and I think it's, it'll be interesting to see what the next couple of weeks brings. I think, I don't think we're done seeing telehealth expand. Um, again, like today, CMS was announcing that they're, they're allowing uh, more access to like tele, uh, like psychiatric services and things like that. And so there's like all kinds of crazy stuff. Like there's teledentistry dentistry in some capacity, which I don't know, but um, uh, maybe it works. But I think, um, part of the like the really cool thing about this too is that I think a lot of the protectionist arguments against opening up you know or lowering the barriers um, to telehealth access have been that it's really expensive for a regular doctor to get a telehealth platform I mean what does that even mean um, Caroline says there's also televeterinarianism which makes total sense um, my dog doesn't have a phone but I'll let him use mine if he needs it um, but anyway so there's just all kinds of like it's it's coming, it's like organically kind of growing in this way. And it's important that we don't let regulators after this begin to sort of like cut that down, that growth down, just for the sake of going back to the status quo. Um, and there's of course all kinds of reasons why that's important. One that I'll just touch on briefly um, because it's not totally telehealth, but um, we are already facing a primary care shortage in the US and the projections for that by 2025 are not great. Um, so most states will face a significant shortage of primary care doctors in large part because a lot of doctors are retiring. Um, I think within the next few years, like 40% of the current primary care workforce will be of retirement age. So you're going to see a lot fewer doctors and that's really bad when it comes to obviously having access to healthcare. Um, states that traditionally have had um, worse access to primary care have worse health outcomes and it's not surprising. Um, and so it's going to become really important to use telehealth when there's simply not a doctor in your area, never mind in a pandemic. So um, that's another way that it's really going to have to, we're going to be forced to open those floodgates to telehealth. So that's it's just very interesting right now to see how quickly it's all evolving and what it'll look like in a month or so. You know, it's funny, over the past couple of weeks, I keep saying stuff like, uh, you know, we've been working on this licensing reform for years, and he just tweeted it out, you know, that's really what it feels like at this point, um, which is, you know, I'm, I'm glad that it's happening. I, it's not like we need to get all the credit. It's just cool to see it happening and kind of funny. But, um, but it, it, you know, there's, there's so many medical reforms that can happen. And there's finally, this is going to hopefully uh, give a lot of evidence to, to back up um, claims of, of you and I and, and other people who were kind of on our side with this stuff. Um, you know, when, when I talk about occupational licensing reform, um, my main equation, which is a very truncated version of basically the Institute for Justice's equation, is, you know, is there evidence of harm? What's, it, you know, it's not an anecdote, not like, oh, my brothers, sisters, dads, cousins, uncle, like, 
no, like not that, but the, okay, when this isn't licensed, this causes harm or, um, or even uh, black markets cause harm, uh, you know, outsize harm in a certain area, um, wherever there, there's evidence that helps, um, which is also why Louisiana is the only state to license florists because floristry doesn't hurt anyone. And thankfully other states have licensed <laughs> evidence there. But, um, but especially in a pandemic, I think it's going to make people take the evidence a little bit more seriously when it comes to a lot of regulatory reforms in, in medication. Um, in so many cases, you, you come across what ifs and, and it, it lets some ideal of the perfect be the enemy of the good. And I don't say actual perfect because it's, it's not like the outcomes are perfect because any kind of regulation is going to raise prices, decrease access for poor people, especially um, decrease access generally, and also um, make it harder for people to climb up the economic ladder. And that doesn't always mean that regulations are bad. Like I'm fine with licensing doctors, just the regulations in place have to have a means and it's fit. Um, and I think, I think one thing you're really gonna see here is, is being able to apply that evidence and showing like, look, when we loosened, whether it's some other work that you do, like scope of practice reform or, um, or broader birth control access or, um, or telehealth, I think that the evidence is going to be taken a little bit more seriously because of it. But what other, I mean, you know, you're, we're seeing so many different kinds of reform occurring right now. Um, it's, <laughs> it's honestly hard to keep track, but exciting that, you know, that they're taking it seriously and not letting any lobbies or any just, again, um, ideas of some perfect regulatory good that doesn't exist get in the way. But what else needs to happen and what needs to be made permanent right now? It's a good question. Um, what else needs to happen? So a lot like insurance is regulated on a state level. So all of these federal announcements that, you know, that we're going to be covering extended telehealth services, that kind of tr has to trickle down into the state level. So obviously, if you're um, on Medicare and Medicaid, that's like, like I said, that's run by your well, Medicaid, sorry, but run by your state. Um, and so we're going to have to see states open up the um, insurance industry basically to include these telehealth services. Um, this is a fight we see in medical disintermediation anyway. Insurance companies don't typically like to reform what's covered or not. Um, and it's, I'm sure there are probably some people here who uh, have experience with this, but it's been very interesting because it, the evidence all points to disintermediating things becoming uh, less expensive. So you, and a lot of these activities are substitutable, right? So like just because you're able to uh, you know, use telehealth uh, to talk to your doctor doesn't mean you're going to double the amount of doctor's visits you have. It's you didn't, you use telehealth, so you're not having to go to the doctor in person, and that's a cheaper visit. Um, so like, because it's substitutable, we should see a decrease in the, the overall economic cost of using telehealth. Um, so I would hope that insurance companies are open to the idea of that. Um, I, I, like I said, I don't know specifically on telehealth, what the insurance industry's attitude is, but in disintermediation, generally we've seen um, insurance providers get a little bit um, antsy when you talk about, like, it, for example, like um, expanding the definition of medical provider to include pharmacists who can prescribe birth control, um, things like that, where, you know, a pharmacist who sees a patient for a birth control prescription um, in some states isn't able to get reimbursed for that because they're not they're not technically a medical provider in that state. So you have some like language in the, on the state level that needs to change right now. Um, so that's one of them. And the things that need to stay permanent, I think are, well, I think there need to be some permanent HIPAA uh, revisions. Um, I don't necessarily think it's realistic to think that after the pandemic is sort of like the ones we've kind of gotten over the, the hump, I don't think we're going to see HIPAA say, you know what, keep using like Skype and, and FaceTime, that's fine. Um, by the way, they, do, they say do not use TikTok. So I don't know if anyone, but that, they've laid that out very clearly. Don't try to yeah, TikTok your doctor. Um, and I think Snapchat was one of those too, it said not to do. So just a friendly reminder. But anyway, um, what I think we might see and what I hope we would see is that HIPAA will relax the definition of of the business associate side of uh, being HIPAA compliant. And so I think that'll look like allowing a company like Apple to sign on to one of these without meeting the same, uh, the same guidelines as before. Um, obviously this will need to be tested for safety and that sort of thing. The big thing with HIPAA obviously in FaceTime is that, you know, is your, like if you're talking to your doctor on FaceTime, is that technically like privately, a private exchange between you and your doctor? 
Um, and so you can see how that can kind of open up some of those concerns. But I do think we're going to see uh, hopefully the threshold for me being HIPAA compliant in certain cases, not, you know, not universal, but I think that might be lowered, um, which would be great to, to keep going um, because that is, like I said, that's going to open up access to telehealth so much. It's one thing to say, well, yeah, technically you're covered by it, you know, if you're on certain public insurance programs, but it's another to, you know, have your grandparent actually know how that works. Um, so, um, so it's going to be really important for people to have access where they are, not not some you know aim for them to be in a certain place like technologically to be able to access it. So that's one of the one of the things that I think we should make permanent. Um, I also think we should uh, make permanent the uh, which I'll let you talk about the license reciprocity that we're seeing, basically saying like you can come here and work, no problem. Um, but I'll save that for you. I also think it's important for us to keep permanent some of these other measures we've seen. So Alabama, for example, extended the uh, the prescription limit. So basically, if you run out of your prescription and you can't see your doctor, you can go to your pharmacist, and you're you know they can see your history of you taking this medication, uh, especially if it's just a routine medication. And they'll be like, yeah, sure, we can refill it for like 30 days, or I think it's 60 days here now. Um, but they did that, but that's not to say that they're great because a lot of states already have that kind of thing. So they're just catching up, not surprising. Um, but so I think we're going to see a lot of a lot of on the margin reforms like that, where we're going to see emergency uh, refill pre prescription refills um, uh, at like smaller pharmacies, because CVS also does something like this in most states, um, technically, but a lot of pharmacies don't offer it. So anyway, there's that. Um, that needs to become permanent. We need to let them do that. We also need to let pharmacists uh, prescribe routine things like travel medication or um, short, you know, temporary prescriptions. So, like, if you're proved, you can prove that you're going out of the country and you need, you know, whatever it is, the, like an anti-malarial. I don't know, but like, if you can prove that, they should be able to prescribe things like that. Um, so, there's just a lot of like very sensible, kind of common sense when you really think about. Some of these scenarios that should become permanent but that's why I'll, I'll turn it over to you for what you think what you think should become permanent um which I'm, my guess is going to be you're going to say everything and that we're not going far enough so i'm curious to know what the answer is i mean yeah and also um i'll mention to all the participants if you want to ask us questions we'll start answering soon um submit in the q a section um, there's on this platform, and I, I love Zoom, but there's like 50 freaking ways to submit questions, but uh, just use the Q&A function for the interim. And I think there's even ways to ask anonymous questions if, if you're afraid of us knowing you're asking a question. But again, feel free to go ahead while, while I finish up here. Um, but yeah, I, I, I definitely think that a lot of this isn't going far enough. I mean, the, the more the merrier and it's working and there's, there really aren't problems. And as, especially in the medical system, it's a little bit better with data collection and making sure things are working. In other parts of the licensing system, it's really hard to get that data. And it's usually private organizations that uh, need to do it rather than the licensing boards. Um, I mean, Lord, I'll tell you, just trying to get cosmetology board data is impossible. They hoard that stuff. Like they will not release their hands off of that licensing data. Um, I think I once found a, a fairly comprehensive study and it was like behind a paywall of the beauty association. I'm like, I'm done. Like we can't do this. But, um, but because of the data here, I think we'll be able to see what's working. And I have a feeling a lot of this is going to work pretty well. One thing you mentioned too that I want to echo is that we have to meet people where they are digitally. You know, um, of course, better better skills on digital are always better but um you know on the marketing side uh one thing i always teach people whether it's our street scholars um you know our street execs uh my team or when i do side consulting there's one really big lesson that you have to meet people where they are you can't create a facebook page and decide i want everyone from instagram to get on my that's not how that works if they're on instagram meet them there. Most think tanks should not be on Instagram and that's another story. I'll get to another time. But, um, but it's really about meeting people where they are and at their skill level and where they're comfortable because if they're not comfortable, they're less likely to do the thing you want them to do. And in marketing, it's often clicking on the link, sharing something or reading something or signing up, you know, on, on the political side, signing up to volunteer or vote or whatever. But, um, but um, you basically have to meet people where they are. And I think that's one really important thing when, when you get to anything that's technological. Um, 
because you see a lot of people on marketing trying to trying really hard to get people out of their normal functions and that's just not how life works um you can put a lot of effort into that and get very little out of it unfortunately um and a lot of people learn that lesson but but um, um that's one thing i'm really glad you talked about um just because that's often an understated point um and on the licensing side i i think one thing that i've been thinking about a lot lately is having more of the Arizona model and there, there are slightly better models out there that make it a little bit easier to become licensed in the state. Um, none implemented yet, but uh, but better versions of the bill. More of that and more um, ways to expedite, whether in a pandemic, a natural disaster, or, um, or maybe there's just a special reason that someone's license needs to go through faster. Um, there should be ways to prioritize, to expedite, because so many states are doing it right now on the fly, and I'm still glad they are, but it would have been easier had they had an Arizona model, and furthermore, had they had an Arizona model with provisions to expedite. There's also other ways to help in natural disasters, as too, like California has a law signed last year um, that, that uh, our colleague Steve Greenhunt worked on, um, and it's basically to help with displacement with natural disaster, and that just means that when, when there's a natural disaster, people can become more licensed easily so they won't be both displaced and not have a license to work, um, which would be really hard to, um, to deal with. But um, you know, the, the reciprocity is working, in, especially with medical licenses in most states, they're reasonably similar. Um, I know that for other professions, it, it may vary more, and even that's not so much of a concern for me generally, but, um, but with medical licenses, they're so similar across states. They should be able to transfer more easily. Um, recognition should be a lot easier. Um, and you're, again, you're seeing a lot of that now, but I'm hoping that people take this seriously and, and make this something long-term. And you never know when it's other kinds of licenses that will be needed, whether maybe rebuilding after a disaster, um, you know, physically with construction or other services that are needed. Um, there's also one thing that, um, that a lot of these waivers generally apply to uh, pharmacists, physicians, nurses, um, and a few others, but I, I would like to see some more of them apply to other kinds of um, medical professionals. I have a friend in New York who's a, um, a certified surgical technician, and she's not able to help with as much as she'd like, but she's doing her best with where the law is. But, um, but there's, a, you know, we need to get deeper into it, I think, or, you know, states need to get a little bit deeper into it to do uh, the best. So I'm going to start taking questions, and I have one here that says, um, seems like there's been a lot of, of great deregulation in the area of medical licensing and telehealth. What deregulation, if any, have you seen on the business side in the wake of the pandemic? Um, so I'll start there. Um, one thing that I've seen quite a bit of, um, sorry, I just had to press the little answer live button. <laughs> one thing I've seen a lot of is just giving uh, more flexibility to businesses, a lot dealing with alcohol deregulation, letting trucks, um, basically uh, letting alcohol delivery trucks also deliver groceries, which is huge right now as grocery stores are running out of like toilet paper and other really basic food things. Um, so that that's one thing that tech, I think Texas was the first to do that. There's also been a lot of deregulation with like letting, um, letting bars and restaurants give people take out alcohol with food. Um, a lot more flexibility generally. Uh, and then we've had some bad examples of those too. Um, I, I think it was in Los Angeles County that they were stopping uh, restaurants from selling groceries, which is insane. I mean, they're selling food in different forms, like it, it's food, like it should be allowed. And I think one of the health commissioners had said something like, oh, well, you know, you can't just decide to sell groceries. <laughs> like it's this, you know, ridiculous idea for a place that uh, buys, prepares and sells food to just buy and sell food, but it's insane. Um, around the corner for me, there's a couple of cafes that are selling basic groceries and I don't know the DC regulations, but they're letting them do it. Um, there's, there's just been a lot of flexibility added and I think the more the merrier here. Um, I know that a lot of businesses are going to have to close and understandably um, because of, we need to make sure that social di distancing is happening. Um, but I've been really, really encouraged by it. Like, it. You know, it's funny, it's another area with alcohol deregulation that like, for decades, people have been like, this is insane. Why can't we like sell alcohol more easily? And it's like just immediately, oh yeah, let's do it. Like we're cool now, <laughs> like just quick deregulation. So there's been a lot of good. There's also some 
more that needs to happen, I think, but, um, but this is all a really good start. Um, Courtney, have you seen other like business deregulations? Oh, I was going to say, I want you to talk a little bit about the work from home situation um, and some of the, the things that have come out about rules and regulations around working from home and what, what counts as like, you know, business in your home and that sort of thing. What have you seen? I don't think it's encouraging, but it's... <laughs> Yeah, um, so uh, so our colleague Jared and I have both worked on the home-based business thing, and um, the Goldwater, the, sorry, the Goldwater Institute has done some fantastic work there. So I, I would point to them as the go-to experts, um, both uh, Timothy and Christina Sandifer, who are not only awesome deregulators but also like couple goals, like they're just deregulating together. It's wonderful. Um, they've done a lot of work on this um, there, and there's a lot of localities that stop people from working from home. Um, it's tech technically about home-based businesses, but it's really like what I'm doing now would be illegal technically in uh, certain places. There was a guy, I want to say Cobb County, Georgia, who had uploaded YouTube videos from his home and the state cracked down on him saying, oh, you have a home-based business. And um, there was a woman working from home alone. Um, I, I, I think this might have been an Arizona locality and uh, the government cracked down on her. You see this all over. Um, and, you know, I, I'm sympathetic to concerns of excess traffic. It, it's not a huge concern to me if it's, if it's causing legitimate amounts of traffic and, and really disrupting the neighborhood, that, that can be a different conversation. But in most cases, it might be one or two cars outside at once. Um, for years, my mom was actually a massage therapist outside of our home. So one person, one car, it was basically like having a friend come over, accept a massage, and they would pay her. But, um, but it wasn't really causing neighborhood disruption or anything. But because of these regulations, I don't know, you know, I haven't seen reports of people being afraid to work from home, but I wouldn't be surprised if they are, especially anyone who's been cracked down uh, by this stuff before. It's, it was a bad idea to begin with because people need flexibility to work from home whether because uh, someone's sick or their family members need their help, whatever it is. Um, it, it was always bad, but especially at a time when they're saying, please stay home. Um, and then uh, AB5 in California has just been a disaster. I'd been talking with a lot of people affected by the law um, even before coronavirus happened. And just the, I, it was heartbreaking. People were going through real, real like mental disasters because their lives were upended. Um, and now they're being forced to stay home. They can't work from home because a lot of them were, were especially like freelance copywriters and editors. They can't, they're not allowed to do that from home anymore. Um, and California refuses to waive that, which is ridiculous, but um, more so, so many uh, states are considering uh, replicating AB5 and that would just already be a disaster, but especially now they should know it's not working. This is not the, the law to have. There, there can be a way to protect freelance contractors, but that's not the way. I was going to say, can you just like give us a two sentence thing about what AB5 was, just in case anybody's not familiar? Yes, um, I'm always so stuck in my head with these regs because I do them day in and day out. Thank you. Um, there is no link in Zoom to be like a citation. Um, it, so basically, AB5 uh, stops people from being contractors. The, the goal of it was to protect people, make sure that they weren't being taken advantage of, that they weren't classified as uh, freelance contractors when they really should have had health benefits and been employees. But um, a lot of the people who this law applied to were seasonal employees, like I'm not even kidding, Santas, or people who did uh, copy editing on a freelance basis, uh, freelance musicians. Um, and the fallout of this law was that uh, like certain businesses couldn't hire musicians anymore to, um, to play at their gig without having them as a salaried employee. Um, people couldn't hire a freelance copy editor. And, and there's certain limits. I, I forget the exact limit, but um, it, it also really applied broadly to writers who were writing for all these different publications who can no longer afford to hire them. So all these places where there's any work that can be done virtually, they're now hiring from out of state, understandably. Um, but it, there's just some really heartbreaking stories. People who, um, who needed the flexibility to work from home because they were really sick or had sick family members and the trade-off for them was worth it. Um, so it, it's just been really hard to see those people already hit while they're down, hit again with coronavirus and seeing California refuse to at least suspend the law for the interim. Um, I, I, last I checked, I think um, the Senate sponsor of the bill in California had said something like, oh no, well, we had good intentions, so we're not going to repeal it. And it's like, oh, people are hurting. You can't be like, oh, but our intentions were good. So we're, you know, it, that's not how lives work. 
Um, I, I hope they do suspend it, but I, I don't think that's going to happen. And with the home-based business laws, I haven't seen any suspensions, but I also haven't seen enforcement, which is also very good. <laughs> it's also like one of the basic like foundational principles of law and regulation is that your intentions don't mean, like good intentions don't mean good outcomes. Right. So it's so important to like retrospectively look at what you, you know, to measure the costs and benefits of something like that. But yeah, it's good intentions are never a, a reason to justify something uh, being put in place, so. Right, exactly. Uh, evidence matters and the evidence isn't reflecting well on, on uh, these regulations and they're still uh, in place, which is frustrating. Um, we don't have any more questions at the moment, but if anyone has more, um, uh, type them now or else. <laughs> yeah, we'll give everyone a few more minutes. Um, feel free to, to put a question in there um, and we'll answer it. But In the meantime, Courtney, do you have anything else to add to the discussion? Anything that you didn't get to say that you wanted to add in? I, well, I was going to say just what I think what this all comes down to, because we've used the word in what I've noticed, we've used the same word in every single uh, area we talked about is flexibility. Like what this really yeah. comes down to is that regulation is causing rigidity in places that we really don't need rigidity right now. And again, I think in, in normal times, uh, you know, agencies and states and politicians can get away with it more. But we're the fact that we were so quickly able to shed so much of this uh, uh, stuff that we've built up um, in terms of red tape, I think is really showing that there really was no need for them before. Um, because like I said, it was so quick. It wasn't like, well, we really have to study what's going to happen if we do this. It's, that wasn't the case at all. Um, it was within days that we really saw, you know, the floodgates kind of open and are continuing to, which is great. So um, yeah, it's just, it really comes down to flexibility and how are you how are you regulating in a way that allows for discretion, which is really important and in the medical field, especially you have like doctors need discretion, um, advanced, you know, medical professionals need to have discretion um, uh, in what they do. So how do you, how do you design a regulatory framework that is that allows for discretion and is robust for changing environments, which is really important um, because you don't really see that. And that's hard to do. I'm not saying that that's like, it's not like, well, yeah, if everybody, you know, if they just let us do it, we would do it, but we would. But anyway, um, but just like allowing for that robustness is really important. So that's what I would add. But it looks like we have another yeah. question. It says, uh, what types of regulations have been lessened to make it easier to practice telemedicine? I'll let you start. Sure. So, um, okay. Thank you. Um, so first, like I said, you're now able to use your normal, like daily consumer platforms. Um, you can talk to your doctor via Skype or FaceTime and they're not going to get in trouble and you're not going to get in trouble. Um, Apple's not going to get in trouble. Um, Skype's not going to get in trouble. So there's that, which is important. And that's kind of the, what we're talking about, meeting people where they are. Um, so that's been relaxed. Um, like I said, um, public health insurance programs are now covering uh, ex more telehealth services which is really important. Um, so before you couldn't necessarily use telehealth for certain things. Um, one of those is, um, I think all, maybe not all, but most um, laws around telehealth are that you have to have already established a patient provider relationship before you use telehealth. So like if you were going to a new doctor, you couldn't use a telehealth platform to talk to them, you would have had to actually like make in-person contact with them first. And we're seeing that waived as well. They're saying you can use this to establish that patient patient provider relationship, which is really important because again, we don't want people leaving their houses right now. So um, that's another thing that's been relaxed recently. Um, what else was I gonna cover? A lot of it's just the fact that we're extending, um, that we're, extending the number of telehealth services you can use um, as like a normal doctor visit or that sort of thing. Like I said, just the use of like tele-ICUs is expanded. Um, and so it's, that's kind of like where the environment is now, if that answers your question. Shoshana, do you wanna add anything? Yeah, I, I definitely think it's about uh, platform flexibility, um, um, coverage flexibility, and then um, just working across state lines. I think a lot of the orders would, um, even if they didn't realize it would intend to, would apply to telehealth because of those location qualifications. Um, so I think it, it's, it's a combination of all those, but it's, you know, it's funny because a lot of CMSs 
uh, recent deregulations have been more narrow than, uh, than you might expect, unless you really read through them and there are many pages. But um, when I was going through it, and I, and I can see they're trying to take a narrow and measured hand with it. Um, one other thing I wanted to add to what you were saying before about the rigidity of regulations, I think that's something people take for granted a lot. Um, and it's something that I've been thinking about a lot, even before this started, but a lot more recently, is that regulations are rigid. They allow for the thing they allow. Basically, any it's um, it assumes anything um, related to that goal that doesn't fit in that narrow regulation is illegal. Um, and I think people forget that. They consider it a nicety or, oh, it's to protect or this is nice or whatever. But they forget that you have to really outline uh, for every most possible positive path to your goal in the regulation. And there might be more that you're missing. Um, I mean, there's pretty much always in, in every case, even in the best regulations. Um, and I think that's something that people really lose sight of. You know, a, a lot of regulations on, in, in licensing don't take into account, like maybe a kid who grew up with a dad who is a barber and, um, and the, the dad teaches his daughter how to cut hair, how to treat hair, um, that won't get you a license down the line. Um, regulations are narrow and rigid, um, and, and there's still ways to allow for more flexibility, but, um, but I think that's, that's just something people forget. They forget that there's alternative methods, and regulators, while they sometimes talk to experts, and, and those experts may have ulterior motives, they may want to, you know, reduce competition, um, they, they often forget about those alternative ways to get to that same uh, result, which is really frustrating. Um, and it's kind of like you're saying here that, that the, the, the medical platform has to be approved. So, um, the, you know, maybe regulators weren't realizing some people won't be comfortable with platforms outside their normal video chat. Um, so I think it's really important that people realize that regulations are rigid and, um, and they, they're just not flexible. Um, oh, and we have one more question here. Um, what arguments might we see from state licensing boards and provider associations after the crisis when they try to re-implement regulations? How can we plan ahead to, cancer, to um, counter those? I'll let you start. That is a great question. And I love this question because um, it's something that I've thought a lot about from the provider associations, uh, in part because um, when you're talking about medical disintermediation, uh, the largest opponent group typically, or at least the loudest, have been the medical providers themselves. Um, and, you know, that's obviously um, in part because they're concerned about patient safety and change, you know, kind of disrupts the status quo. And so they get concerned about patient safety, which is totally understandable. But when we have enough evidence to say that patient safety isn't hindered at all by making certain, you know, reforms um, in terms of like lowering the barriers to certain uh, healthcare access, whether it's, you know, using telehealth or whether it's allowing um, nurse practitioners to operate independently in their state, basically. Um, there's all kinds of different things that a lot of medical providers and associations really don't like. Um, and so it will be really interesting to see what happens when we come out of this. Um, to see what they have to say in terms of why we shouldn't make these reforms permanent. I think one maybe that we'll see is just basically that, you know, some medical care is better than no care at all. And so, you know, in an in a emergency situation, of course, we want all hands on deck, but in order for us to, um, you know, kind of go back to what people are used to and kind of using the platforms that worked for them, they may say we need to go back to, you know, the way things were before. Um, but also they probably could bring up cost as an issue. Um, you know, maybe it's, it's probably like depending on the telemedicine platforms that people are able to use, which is another thing I hope that um, if you're allowed, like if you're making it cheaper for people to access, that also means we have to make it cheaper for doctors to adopt because that's a big thing too. Um, is that, you know, again, like your local doctor probably can't afford to implement like all of the things that would need to happen for him to become like HIPAA compliant with telehealth. Um, that's why you have like companies who do it, not like individual doctors. And so I think we're going to have to lower the barriers there. Otherwise, we will see doctors talk about how this is unfair because the cost is so high for them to use telehealth. And so in, in turn, it's hurting their patient safety because they're not able to see them as often or something. Um, but otherwise, I don't, I honestly don't know. And I'm very curious to see what happens because I know we will, like, I know we will hear from um, people a lot on this about why after the pandemic is, you know, after we kind of 
see the light at the end of the tunnel. I think um, for them, for example, people say, okay, like, let's wrap it up. Let's go back to normal. Um, but I, I'm very curious to see what the arguments are. And I, again, it's probably, probably something to do with cost and safety. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, especially in, in this field, um, I mean, all, all opponents of regulatory and licensing reform always go, well, people will die, but at least uh, people in the medical profession have some actual claim to that. But um, I'm hoping that there's, and it's going to sound silly almost, but I, I'm really hoping there's more academics who come up and say, look, here are studies showing this works. This was better than the alternative. We couldn't have handled this without these reforms. And there, there's already so many studies showing that um, opening uh, pharma pharmacists uh, scope of practice, nurse scope of practice, and um, working across state lines would help people from just about every angle. Um, and I'm hoping that those studies gain more credence now and that I think, I think one thing that's going to help is that doc, the, uh, sorry, um, governors are going to, and pol politicians generally, are going to say, realize that it can be a popular position to want these narrow medical reforms. Um, and when, when uh, elected officials in particular, but also any government official, sees a good P PR opportunity, um, not even just from a, a, a place of opportunism, but just because um, you know, it, it, it sucks to get pushback for trying to do the right thing. And if they can do the right thing and get less pushback, I think they're going to be more likely to do those things. Um, so while licensing boards and certain uh, lobbies may push back, and even, even for good reason and, and understandable reason, I think you're going to see a lot of momentum just from the people who realize that this can now be a popular sense and not a, oh, libertarians don't want doctors to be licensed. We do. Um, I think most of us do at least. Um, but I think there's just going to be a lot of opportunity here and we have to make sure not to squander it, make sure that the academics are putting out the papers that show the evidence and if the evidence shows it works then following that um, going off of older evidence too and um and making sure that we keep the pr good on our side um because pr opportunities lost here can mean um reform opportunities lost um and that also means you know i'm a, I'm a big fan of arthur brooks and you know loving your enemies and stuff so less yelling more yay data shows this thing that, that can help everyone and like you're saying um you know, it, it's it, it's back to that perfect being the enemy of the good thing, where um, where we were like, oh, when did, well, you know, nurses can't just treat alone because, but it's like many of us go to the doctor, never see the doctor, or maybe see him for half a second, and that fulfills some regulatory compliance, even though the nurse treated us just fine, or even though we could obtain um, some very basic birth control or other medication from a pharmacist. Um, and that's, that's letting perfect be the enemy of the good when the, we always have to go to the doctor there rather than freeing up the doctor for more serious cases or if, um, if we maybe have other complications that might interfere with those medications and would want to talk to a doctor. But, um, but access to care is, should be the ultimate goal. Um, and I, I think that, you know, it's, it's wild times, but I think we're really starting to see a lot more openness here, especially because before uh, licensing reform, really focused on that low-hanging fruit, the hair braiders, the florists, um, the fortune tellers. There's at least three localities in California, Maryland, and Massachusetts I know of that license fortune tellers because you wouldn't want a bad fortune teller. Like, trust me, um, I've been there. But, um, but now seeing it get into more serious professions, um, wh which it already was, but whenever you talked about licensing reform as it related to doctors or nurses, um, you got, oh, well, I didn't think you guys were gonna touch that from the licensing angle, but now people are starting to understand we're not talking about de-licensing there, but just expanding scope of practice and access to care and location. And I, I really am thankful for uh, Governor Ducey's model last year, because I think with that model, at least states will have an idea of something to implement and there's more model legislation that's similar to it and even better that other organizations have put out. So having an idea of, of seeing that it works and how it works and now knowing that you're going to want to put in provisions to expedite, I think all of this comes at a very important and very good time. Um, I mean, even uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed legislation like right before all this started. And I don't think it was even uh, with coronavirus in mind, but to expand nurse and pharmacist scope of practice. So some of these reforms were sort of happening anyway, but I think you're, you're going to see a lot more acceleration um, due to all of this. 
So we're just about out of time, but if anyone has any quick questions, feel free to let us know. Um, but you can find our work at rstreet.org. And um, if we can ever help with any work you guys are doing, always feel free to reach out. Um, you can DM me on Twitter or uh, Courtney's more of a normal person. So you can like email her because she has an inbox and I have like 15 inboxes. Um, I go where people are needed. She's a normal human who has more work to do. So she has like a normal inbox. <laughs> That's old and doesn't access all of these platforms. Um, like I was definitely calling Zoom Skype for like a couple of weeks. It's fine though. <laughs> Talk about meeting people where they are with telehealth, my God. Um, but anyway, yeah, it looks like we can wrap up if nobody else has any questions. All right. Thanks everyone for joining us and uh, let us know how we can help. Yeah. Thank you guys.